53 years ago, this river was on fire. It wasn't the first time, but for whatever reason, the 20 minute blaze that was so short, nobody could even take a photo of it, sent a spark across the nation. In between pages about the dazzling allure of space travel, Time Magazine, in its first ever environment section, printed a 17-year-old photo of the same seeming impossibility. The Cuyahoga River was burning, and with that came the world's attention. This river and others across the country were inundated with oils and greases, leading some to characterize them as sewers to the lakes and oceans. A tract of land an hour away from the burn exemplifies why that matters. A community of people surrounding the industrial excess landfill in Uniontown, Ohio, find their neighbors dying of cancer too often and too young as their water is infected by toxic waste that seeped into the groundwater. They can't drink it, and even showering has become a risk. Imagine being scared of what comes from your own faucet. Water is crucial but we rarely think about it. Clean water, open spaces, these should once again be the birthright of every American. So in 1972, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, or CWA, a momentous change intended to take the decades of slow growth in water quality to a new level to save the waters of the US. But would it work? The CWA's objective was to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters through a few key improvements. First, the EPA, who facilitates the act, would start creating water quality standards. There are limits, and we call those water quality standards, to how much uh, ammonia can be in the river, to how much zinc can be in the river. We use EPA, what are called biological indexes. These are indexes that already have correlated fish communities or insect communities, because they're both important, to the water quality. And it isn't just a good or bad, it's like the sliding scale. Where we used to be blind to the toxic substances in our waters, we now had a grasp of the dangers that lurked within. Second, the act added a permit structure. Take this steel mill on the Cuyahoga River, for example. They need to discharge more pollutants into the water than the average person, so the EPA looks at their needs and sets limits for how much they can discharge without harming the environment. So think of it like a driver's license. You want to drive a car on the road, you need a driver's license to legally do that. Let's say you have a factory and you have a bunch of folks and you need to discharge the sanitary wastewater after treatment. You need a permit to do that. So this mill still sends out things like ammonia, zinc, and cyanide, but as long as they don't exceed safe amounts, it's okay. You have speed limits on roads. If you go over that speed limit, you can get a ticket. So the same thing applies for us. Still, sometimes even that waste is too much. So in this instance, the company created its own water treatment plant to remove chemicals before dumping into the water. Finally, the law gave the EPA the ability to find violators of the act. In 2011, there was a huge fish kill and a, a long investigation by agencies from local level all the way up to federal level pinned it on a, a company that illegally dumped, uh, believe it or not, a cyanide waste product into a storm drain and there were felony convictions in that. It gave the Clean Water Act teeth. And for communities who can't afford to lower their discharges, the government offers low interest loans to help build new infrastructure. Loans like these are what help the regional sewer district in Cleveland lower their overflows year after year. And we have a $3 billion construction project called Project Clean Lake, which is building underground storage and holding for these overflow events. So when these pipes overflow, they overflow into a storage tank underground, and then that tank will hold the water until the rain event is over and the plant has the capacity to treat that water. But while it may seem simple, the act is fraught with debate. President Nixon vetoed the original bill despite starting the Environmental Protection Agency two years before. He said cleaning waterways was of urgent concern, but the cost, which would be about $160 billion today, was unconscionable. But then Congress overturned the veto with a 10 to 1 yes to no ratio in the House. And yet challenges continue. Multiple Supreme Court cases have hinged on its undefined term, navigable waters, which is meant to define the waters the law affects. Every administration has had to come up with their own definitions, and those have been highly and hotly debated in court. I admit to being somewhat confused by this, primarily because of the earlier Clean Water Act settlement. And a 2015 Obama-era extension of the act was removed by the Trump administration for being an overreach. The EPA decided that navigable waters can mean nearly every puddle or every ditch on a farmer's land or any place else. Meanwhile, others say the Clean Water Act doesn't do enough. We have barely begun to address the problems caused by urban 
and agricultural runoff. But in spite of it all, 53 years ago, this river was on fire, but it hasn't burned since. The previous pools of oil and grime that were the Cuyahoga River are now okay to fall in, though it might be cold. People who live here can enjoy our absolute greatest resource, which is our Great Lakes. We were down to like four or five species of fish in the Cuyahoga River. Today we're back to 73. I would actually say that that's one of the most amazing, positive environmental success stories like in our nation's history. The Flats, a place previously defined by its foul stench and dirty waters, now host restaurants and apartments on the water's edge, and today I guess a bunch of birds, after hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. And while we take it for granted, we have clean water to drink. But we're not done yet. The original act set a goal to eliminate pollutant discharge into navigable waters by 1985, and there's a way to go until we're there. But also, just as important as water, today our society faces a new match ready to flame climate change. We've done these kinds of things before, but it does take collective will. On the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, we learned that it's possible to change our environment for the better. But in 1969, we waited until a river was on fire to make serious progress to clean our waters. So are we going to wait until our world burns to save it?